Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm recording here with with Matt Rogie, Marchin, and Ma Matt talking about the Thunderhead filament extruder. I just brought up the point about uh, it's called what's it called? Philostruder? Oh, uh, yeah, the Philostruder. Philostruder. Um, so the Thunderhead works on PET, and then I was looking at the internet, and it turns out the Philostruder can do. They claim to do PET as well, but it turns out it was really PETG, which is glycol uh, modified PET, which is actually able to be extruded with a filament maker like the Philostruder. Now the Philostruder, that's that's not open source, right? Um, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I think it started out as an open source project. I think it it may be. Um, yeah. I'd have, to, I'd have to look it up. No, I, I uh, think... There, I mean, there are, there's a whole number of very similar uh, extruders, each with their little different tweaks. You know, I would say mine included. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just to wrap up that story, there was uh, I was like, okay, well, why why go through the effort of the Thunderhead when, when this... Uh, small smaller philostruder like machine can do it also the other thing is that the throughput is very slow it appears to be as matt said here eight hours to put out a kilogram and matt's best results so far have been one to two kilograms per hour so that's i mean if you talk about that in 24 hours you know that's 24 kilograms well that could be 24 spools of filament and you know 10 bucks 20 bucks a roll that's uh economically sustainable so that's that's really yeah. good yeah now i should say with regard to the philostruder and other extruders like that um so the post that you linked to was actually from i think 2014 yeah um so their extruders are quite a bit faster now even depending on what version of the philostruder you buy I think some of the newer ones, maybe all of the newer ones, come with a screw that's actually designed for plastic extrusion. Uh huh. And so that must price, um, but it also bumps the throughput way up. Um, so so uh, yeah, the the older filament extruders, um, you know, were definitely a lot slower, and I you know I can't speak for the. the yeah, yeah. And in, in yours, you're just using as the simple auger bit, the 5 8 inch auger bit? Yeah, I'm using a half inch auger bit. Uh, but yeah, and so that's actually one of the problems with the Thunderhead is that the, we're using an auger instead of a uh, plastics extrusion screw. Um, what's the difference? What's the price difference when you go to the professional level? So I think. I think um, it would be like thirty dollars versus, say, around two hundred dollars. Uh -huh. um, so I, I'd have to check. I've had a, I've had a link. I need to follow up. There's a supplier in China um, that uh, Re3D shared with me that that uh, can supply plastics extrusion screws. Um, and they told me that for a small one, much uh, uh, quite a bit shorter than than what I'm using in the Thunderhead, uh, they were quoted about 150 dollars. Uh huh. Uh, but you know the the difficulty is is that the the, the screws for plastics extrusion have a, a varying core diameter. Yeah. And, and frequently a varying pitch as well, so it's it's not something that you can easily do on your old school ways at home. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Were you thinking about uh, up upgrading sometime or not really? I think it would be, I can put out about it. Um, the, you know, a, a wood auger is, you know, all it does is convey the plastic. It doesn't feel pressure. Um, yeah. And it doesn't really... Uh, you know, it's not designed to say mix or anything like that. If you were, if you were putting in, you know, mixing fonts of a different color, um, you know, like master batch or something like that. So I think it, it, it would help quite a bit, and it's definitely worth investigating. Um, that said, uh, you know, 
for us, it's really kind of figuring out that balance uh, between off-the-shelf parts and you know something that we have to special order. Uh, right. Well, definitely the advantage of just the low cost and everything else. I mean, I guess the idea is if, if there's adequate performance, then that's all we would need. Yeah. 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 Although, you know, if you think about it in terms of the, the overall cost of the machine, say we moved, you know, say we bumped the price by a hundred bucks and doubled the output or, mm. you, know, re, you know, improved the consistency of the diameter to where no uh, uh, diameter sensor on the printer is needed, you know, that's definitely worth it. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, I think um, once I'm through with this current round of documentation, that's uh, one of the things that's kind of top on my list is, is, you know, investigating different suppliers of screws and, you know, it may come may require changing our barrel to fit say like they're like well if you use that size barrel we don't we'd have to make it special but if you change your barrel size to i don't know 14 millimeters or whatever then all of a sudden we have a rack of them we can just um you know uh, sell it for a little cost. uh you know it'd be worth switching up the design of the extruder to, to test those things out yeah 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 okay that sounds good. Um, continuing on, the, so so back to the the GitHub page. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see the diagram. Is there so the diagram, which is the major components of the Thunderhead? Um, yep. So so how far did you get altogether? That's that's as far as you got so far. Yeah, in terms of uh, kind of. Uh, with our last email, you had said it'd be nice to have a diagram of the machine yep. and go through the, the major components and, and what they do. So, yep. I I just uh, coming off my little Christmas break, just just kind of bang that up um, to give an overview. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. That's what I've got. I I don't know if if you've got any. Uh, uh, questions about the different parts or one thing I thought was that um, so, so each of these main components will basically have its own wiki page or quite possibly multiple wiki pages um, you know that go into the details of building and um, uh, how they operate yeah yeah, definitely. So, I mean, this is pretty sophisticated. So, you actually have a balance measuring out a correct amount of flake uh, in the feeder. Yeah. So the star feeder, um, I, it's one of those things where I'm hoping to get rid of that. It and it really depends on. Uh, yeah. Hey, maybe can you turn off your video? I think it's a little slow. Okay. Um, so the star feeder, basically the idea with it is, is if you add, uh, flake or pellet into the extruder at a constant rate and you make that rate slightly less than the capacity of the machine, yeah. um, you know, like 90% of yep. what the machine would be outputting, then, um, let's say the flow in the machine kind of reduces a little bit, maybe for that, you know, what we were talking about, like stick and slip, um, you know, maybe the, the for some reason the, the filament, the, the, the plastic isn't flowing through as quickly, then there's some buffer and the plastic will actually build up in the barrel, which will increase the pressure and help to restore the flow. Whereas if it's at capacity, there's, you know, you, you can't say fill the, the barrel a little more, or if it's over extruding, you know, as the, as the, if the barrel's over extruding compared to normal, the amount of plastic in the barrel would actually reduce. And if plastic in the barrel reduces pressure at the end of the sprue, 
would also go down, which would tend to reduce the flow. So that works with star feeding, but if you're flood feeding, where you just have the hopper right on top of the feed through, then if it's overfeeding, there's still more plastic coming in behind it, and so it wouldn't tend to correct itself as quickly. Wow, okay. So that's the kind of idea behind um, I read that in correct diameters by as much as 5% in industry. Um, so, so basically it's just kind of a control measure to, to even the output. Um, now, the other reason why it was on there is because we're extruding flake instead of pellets. And so pellets flow easily, um, but flakes tend to uh, bridge and jam. So if you just put a hopper on top of the feed throat, sometimes what will happen is you get this little bridge in there and the plastic won't be flowing into the machine, and then um, your output will taper off then maybe every once in a while a bridge will collapse and then you'll get a flood of plastic in. So that can also, you know, cause some variation if you, um, you know, if you think about that kind of, you know, like, like flour flowing through a chute, sometimes it, you know, it doesn't just flow evenly. It kind of goes yeah. in avalanches. Um, so the, the vibratory conveyor, which is part of the star feeder, um, helps to move that flake uh, smoothly. You know, kind of the vibrations kind of help fluidize the, the flakes. Yeah. Uh, get them to move nicely. Yeah. Okay. And um, let's see. I was going to show you the motor. Have you looked at the motor that's that they use within the Lyman filament extruder? Because as far as strength, I mean, it's not a it's not a stepper, but it's a, it's just a regular motor. But how how much control do you need to to have over the motor speed because this one the experience with us from the Lyman filament extruder was that it was pretty manageable uh, you, you just set the speed using a controller would that be oh. adequate because that motor there was $89 and it was way overpowered for the Lyman filament maker um, oh. but let, I'm trying to yeah if you have a, a link for, for it I could definitely check out check it out uh, you know, compare compare the specs on it. Right. Um, let me let me look at this here motor. Uh, I want to pull it up right now. It's because uh, I mean, if it's three hundred bucks compared to like eighty bucks, I mean that's yeah, it's a huge saving. That's a good one. Gear motor. Gear motor. What RPM does it run at? The exact, um, let me, let me see, let me see. I forget. Um, take a look at, this is our Lyman film and extruder page, and for some reason I'm not able, there's a bill of materials there, but I'm not, that bill of materials seems to be conspicuously missing the motor. Uh, take a look at that in a link. But that's what I'm sifting through that. Power, core power supply, voltage regulator, knob, switches, extreme guns, washer stress, guns, bushing, under bed. Oh, gear motor, 15 RPM. Okay, yeah. Let me pull that up. Oh, yeah, 15 RPM. So we typically run at 50 to 60 RPM. Ah. Wow, so you guys are really pushing it. Yeah. Yeah, and I would even like to run a bit faster. Um, you know. Yeah. We've, I've run it up at around 70, um, but if there's like, you know, it's just at its absolute pork limit. So if, um, mm -hmm. if like there's, say, a, a, a flake 
that jams in between the screw and the barrel or something like that. You know, the, the screw can't can't shear it off, and so this the motor just starts skipping steps, and it'll just like automatically stop everything. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But yet, what kind of throughput do you get at at fifteen RPM? I can't tell you because we haven't run the machine. Oh, so. Okay. Uh, but take a look at this one from the same company there, same price, at 50 RPM. Is that the kind of, um, is that torque sufficient? 50 kilogram centimeters. Let's say 51. Hours, I'm just trying to look it up. is... 4,200 ounce inches. Um, and it's all going to depend on the torque curve and, and so on. Uh, yeah, this one has got 700 ounce inches as opposed to saying 4,000. Yeah. Um, Pretty big torque difference. I don't think that would how much are you pushing your motor are you like half half of its power, its torque or something or we're, we're running like so in terms of torque it um you know you the if you look at the torque versus rpm on the stepper at slow speeds you get really high torque yep. and then you get faster and faster you know it slowly dies off to a certain point and then it steeply dies off. Right. Um, and so uh, we're kind of trying to run it right at that point where it, where it takes the dive. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't tell you exactly where it is. It's definitely, definitely below the, the rated torque there. Um, definitely below the rated rated torque yeah but then we're also gearing the motor down oh you're still so gearing that, it down that's 60, so that's 60 rpm um that's the auger speed and we're uh we're running the motor at three times that uh-huh so you got three times reduction yep wow so you're really cranking um that so the, one of the well, I don't know. How, I don't know how long the screw is in the Lyman. Yeah, it's a it's a full sized wood bit, like you know, like twelve inches or something. Twelve, fourteen inches, sixteen inches. Forget. Okay, yeah, ours are, that we're running is is an eighteen inch wood auger. Yeah. Um, and we've run it with smaller motors, significantly smaller motors, and it just just limits how fast you can turn the machine. Huh. So when it's that, I mean, that bit has so much resistance to it, because when I tried the motor that we have, I mean, you can't hold it with your hand, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems like, okay, if it's molten plastic, like, where's all that resistance? Um, there's uh, so when it, as it's melting, it turns into like kind of taffy consistency. Yeah. Um, and then you know, it, it also yeah. really depends on, on the plastic. Um, you know, some, some plastics slip in the screw a lot more than, than others do. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of friction in there, and actually, when you extrude uh, frequently, uh, you know, I've read that you know, like even 80% of the heat uh, comes from friction between the plastic and the screw and the barrel, um, and so the heaters are really just used to, to to kind of top it off and maintain the, the set points. But a lot of the the heat is coming from that that friction. Oh, that's in your machine or in others? That's in most extruders. Right. You know, when you when you 
when you extrude very slowly, I think the situation changes quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, it seems like with what you're doing, you're not getting much resistance heating, right? Um, or do you think? I, I think there's probably a fair amount. Um, again, I haven't, got, I haven't gone through and calculated out, like, okay, we're melting this much plastic and we're losing this much heat and we're putting this much heat in and putting this much power into the screw. You know, I haven't, I haven't gone through. Right. Okay. Um, let me ask you the crystallization question. When, when you dip it into, in water, how, how cold is the, or how warm is the water? So the water is typically, I just room temperature, so it's probably somewhere around 70, 50 to 70, depending on the ambient environment. Uh -huh. it's something that, again, so like in industry, they control the temperature of the water bath. Um, you know, and that significantly, in, significantly impacts the rate of cooling of the plastic. So crystallization is prevented when you go right into water? Is yes. that what's how does how does that work it seems like that's kind of like the opposite of uh what do you call that of um like in metals when you cool it slowly it gets you get big crystals it's the same oh it's the same when you cool slowly you get big crystals yeah so like in order to make amorphous metals they will like drip molten metal onto a rotating plate really fast and get it to like flash cool and you can actually even get amorphous metals. Um, with, uh, um, with the plastics, you know, it's, it's all about uh, do the polymers uh, or, you know, for other substance molecules, do they, do they have uh, time and enough energy to arrange themselves into that compact structure? If you if you pull the energy out fast enough that that they no longer have that mobility, they you know the, the crystals can't can't develop. And crystals are brittle. Yeah, the big crystals are make make it you know when you get large crystals. So like the PLA, well, my understanding of that is that it crystallizes, but it crystallizes quickly. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, it, it retains, you know, it's not as brittle. It is more brittle if you, if you look at it, say, yeah. compared to ABS or HDPE. Yeah. Do you want the bath as cold as possible in, in this case? Um, I think, uh, so the cooler, I mean, I guess I would say, um, for me, it's more of a cost things so yeah so if if uh just using ambient temperature works okay yeah um, i'd go with that one of the one of the issues that uh i think we're going to to um be dealing with is that if you know because we haven't yet been able to say get this thing running all day long yeah um but as you do that, right, so you're just pouring all that heat into the bath, especially right underneath the nozzle. And so the water there on the surface gets hotter than the rest of the, the bath. So I think we will have to add a circulation pump into the water bath. Yeah. Just slowly move the water and, and distribute that heat. Um, do you think... If, Go ahead. If you if you're near zero, like right now it's freezing here, is that actually better for the filament production? Yeah, that, I mean that would that would basically um, you know get you know get the filament into its final shape more yep. quickly. Um, one of the things that I've noted is that um, say when you're stretching the filament. Um, you know, it comes into the water bath and, and the outfeed's pulling it, so you're stretching it. And when the filament diameter varies, it's the thinner spots that stretch more than the thicker spots. Yeah. 
so the longer you're pulling on it, those thinner spots are straight. You know, you know, the, the, the longer those thinner spots are are uh, soft. Yeah. You know, so for example, you really notice it when an air bubble comes through. So then you have very little plastic and very little strength right in one spot, and that spot will stretch way down. Um, yeah. So, and you're thinking that would be helped by cooling faster? So if it was, if you're cooling it faster, you basically just limit the amount of time yep. that, that, that necking, you know, that stretching down yeah. happens. Yeah. I'm curious about the underfeeding. I mean, is that has that been critical? Like w when you overfeed, um, so that feeding versus starved feeding. Yeah. Um, so what I would like to do. So again, you know, now the the, the non-contact diameter sensor is finally working. Is do a series of tests. Okay, let's extrude everything the same, and you know, flood feed versus starve feed. Um, and just see, you know, can we achieve more even throughput with the star feeder than we can with blood feeding? And then if the answer is yes, we keep the star feeder. If the answer is no, we, we <laughs> chuck that thing because it's a, it's a, you know, a, quite a large extra lump of complexity. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, I mean, how does that work? So, so you're essentially putting that on a scale, and I mean, can you describe that process a little more? Sure. So the uh, the um, the star feeder has its own microcontroller um, that you know controls all the processors. So we have. The, I'm trying to build the whole machine modular. So, so yeah, there's the main master. Uh, microcontroller that controls everything in the extruder body, and then the star feeder, the diameter sensors, and the spooler all have their own microcontrollers so that they can just make their own decisions, and the, and the main controller just tells them what to do. Um, yeah. So what's going on on that microcontroller is there's a little bucket in the star feeder um, on a lever um, yeah, you could think of it just like a Japanese water bamboo water feature, you know, where yeah. where the, the water fills up the bamboo, and once it gets to a certain point, the uh, center of gravity switches from one side of the lever to the other side and it tips. And so we have a sensor in there, an uh, optical slot sensor that can sense when the bucket has tipped. Um, and so, you know, it knows there's, I don't know, it's about one gram of plastic. Uh -huh. uh, and then it waits. So let's say you're going to deliver one gram of plastic every 10 seconds. So it'll wait for the 10th second and then dump the bucket of plastic into the machine and reset and turns on the vibratory conveyor to fill the bucket again. And once the bucket's full, it shuts off the vibratory conveyor and it waits. Um, uh, so you have a weight sensor, or that's passive. It's the it's it's not sensing weight. It's sensing there, there's a lever that so there's a, a, a I see. called an optical slot sensor. It's frequently used on 3D printers for uh, end stop. Yeah. Well, I would say far less frequently than mechanical ones, but um, so the balance blocks that sensor, and when the bucket on the other side of that lever is full, then the end of the lever tips and unblocks the sensor and the Arduino knows. That right. Bucket. It tips, so basically like a, like a seesaw? Yep, exactly. But wow. it doesn't tip and dump, it just tips and then sits there. Uh huh. So it's kind of in an intermediate stage, and then the star feeder waits until the time is right to, to get the right feed Wow. Rate. No, that's interesting because I mean that might have uh, have application because one thing that I'm working on is a professional grade soil mixer, dose which doses cement into the soil mixture. So maybe maybe I could use this because the uh, amount of dosing of cement the cement is like a pound per block. 
something similar might be might be use usable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you certainly like using a, a you know a, a lever like that. I mean, you can you can make them very sensitive. Yeah. Um, you know that. That would be interesting. Did you develop all that from scratch, or you you borrowed yeah. others, or? I I mean, it's that thing soaked up a ridiculous amount of time. Because so I, I tried all these methods of you know we were having problems with bridging and damming and so on and so I, you know all sorts of and, and I read about star feeding and I thought oh that would be great but trying to create a mechanical thing that that feeds um, flakes in at a at a constant rate um, you know, say if if you were going to use it, well, screw actually has quite varied flow through it. So, but but the other problem with the screw is that um, you end up with flakes jamming between the screw and the barrel if you're trying to use like this little teeny thing just to, you know, something like a dog food, <laughs> sort of automatic dog food uh, thing where there's a screw that just kind of pushes out that many. Uh, dog food pellets, um, but because the flakes are so ununiform, you end up getting jamming, and you'd have to use a really big motor to to kind of grind its way through that. Uh, so I finally found the vibration, like a vibratory conveyor, worked really well for the motion. Uh, and then yeah, the the kind of Japanese water balance thing just kind of popped into my mind as a, as a wow. method for, for getting the right amount in because you know at first I, I you know I, I had I've tried different things I saw uh, one thing was a, you could use like a rotating cone it kind of looks like a cement mixer but a longer cone and as you rotate that the flakes move down the cone and then fall out the, the end and the rate at which you rotate it changes the rate at which the, the flakes come out I did that I did you know, something that looked, what, I don't know, like a, a, looked like a table saw blade in housing that would kind of have all these little buckets that would you know, scoop up uh, pellets or flakes and then dump them in on their way over. But all sorts of jamming issues with that. I, um, yeah, this was the one method where basically flakes are allowed to flow freely and, and can't cause a mechanical jam. Um, so you have a vibratory mechanism there as well? Yeah, so if you look at the vibratory conveyor, um, the, there's an angle that's supported on, um, on a square tube, and what links the two of them are a bunch of very small leaf springs. Oh, we actually wow. just use an old tape measure the steel's good for that. Um, oh, good. There's plenty uh, of that around here, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going <laughs> to I think the shop's got plenty of old uh, tape measures. Yeah. Uh, well, we could finally recycle. actually would work well for that is the strapping that, that they'll use to, like, bind up a, a bunch of uh, structural steel or something like yeah. that. That strap is pretty good for spring steel. Um, but anyhow... And, and so there's a motor on the bottom of the angle, and it's got an eccentric weight on it. So when the motor runs, the angle vibrates back and forth. Um, but that back and forth also has a little bit of vertical component into it, and so it flings the flakes up and towards the end of the uh, conveyor with each rotation. So the, the flakes actually move uphill. Okay. Uh, and oh, then wow. there's a joint at the end of the vibratory conveyor where it actually angles down. Wow. And the idea there is to take this, um, this flow. So one of the things we were, <laughs> we just used a one angle was that you would end up with this huge 
gusher of plastic into the bucket and fill the bucket really quickly. And if you turn down the amount of vibration to get a, a slow flow, you, you, it was just too hard to get the, the right amount of flow. But with that change in angle, it's kind of like a river with a rifle. And so that, that flow of plastic, you know, strings out and becomes a, you know, just a series of single flakes, you know, so you, you can um, fill the bucket in a much more controlled manner and catch right when the bucket has, has crossed the tipping point. Hmm. And uh, the vibration itself is, what is it, like an eccentric or a bump? Yeah, it's an, it's an eccentric weight on a motor. Yeah. So it just vibrates, you know. And um, Is it just a stepper motor? No, it's just a little DC motor I pulled out of a old jet printer. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty sophisticated. And you you so you haven't tried things like a like a screw auger or anything like that because oh, yeah, I have had tons of problems with the you know, say with a say a, like a I don't know, a little wood auger inside of a tube. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had wow. all kinds of problems with the flakes jamming in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, trust me, I would love to eliminate the star feeder. Um, I think with the... So again, the star feeder was on there. Historically, we had very low quality flake. If we continue using the high quality flake that we're producing with the chopper, then I think we may be able to do away with the star feeder. Mm -hmm. It flows like pellets practically. You know, it's 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 very regular. Um, uh huh. So just just the screw feed, the flood feed would work. Yeah. So I think flood flood feeding would, would probably work just fine. Huh. Yeah. Um, again, you know, <laughs> like uh, it's all stuff I haven't had a chance to test. Um, yeah, yeah. But so you know, we're and like now in Nairobi, you know, they're focusing on getting the microscopes out, so they also haven't had a chance to to just sit back and test for a while. Um, yeah. So that's probably when I get my new extruder built, those will be the things that I'll I'll be working. With. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right for for the quality of the of the grind you said there were troubles when you have too many too many fines is that jamming the auger and yeah those fines um they melt differently right therefore they, they melt differently and for example the um you know the 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 grooves that you cut in the in the feed throat yeah. The fines will collect in those grooves and keep the, the flakes from from uh, gripping. Right. Grooves. Um, but once you're down the barrel enough and the grooves are still there, don't they get clogged up? The grooves are only extend down the barrel a couple of inches. Oh, okay, yeah. So the, the, the plastic is still solid at that point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely get rid of the fines. That's no way around that. Yeah, you know, you can handle some amount of fines. Um, we uh, we had uh, some some of the some of the flake that they made for us in Tanzania, where we had them basically take what they ground and run it through the grinder again to get finer material, and it had enough fines in it that we were not able to successfully extrude it, and we had to get out some screens and screen everything before we ran it through the extruder. Yeah. Which is something you can do. Then you just have all this plastic powder. Uh, yep. You gotta deal with. Um, okay. Uh, and that pro that could possibly be addressed, like, for example, if you have the uh, professional screw, does that still have the grooves in the barrel, or no? The, well, with a professional screw, um, so it may feed, 
you know, because the feeding zone of the screw is also designed to feed plastic, um, you know, more than a, a, you know, a wood auger is, like, designed to remove, uh, remove wood chips, like, and, you know, flow in the exact opposite direction. Right. Um, so it may feed much better and may eliminate the need to put the grooves in the feed throat. You know, wouldn't that be great? There's another step you could avoid. Yeah, that's interesting. One thing, one thought that comes to mind is lost PLA casting of that auger. Oh, yeah, you know, I had thought about that as well. I wonder if, um, yeah, you know, I wonder, you know, if we did lost PLA casting, um, yeah. Doing that, and then you throw it on a lathe and just true up the outside edge so it fits in the barrel nicely. Um, mm -hmm. It would be really interesting to try. I mean, I've done a little bit of casting, but not much. Um, you know, uh, is guy, the idea that the grooves are needed because of the tolerance between the walls of the DOM and the, the auger are just it's just too much space there or it helps in general no it it helps in general um because when the at the point when the plastic isn't yet molten it doesn't stick to the barrel very well so it tends to go around in circles yeah yeah, yeah. um so it just doesn't feed very very well you know it, and so like if you're extruding at really slow rates if your auger is moving really slowly, that's probably not much of an issue. Because even yeah. gravity is trying to keep flakes from going around in a circle. Because you know, it would have to lift up in the air. Yeah. Um, but when the screw is moving more quickly, uh, I think that, I mean, I'm not 100% certain, but I would imagine that also contributes to the, the issue of the not feeding in as well. Yeah. Uh, the the cooling tube is that actually heated? The the bent yeah. tube. Yeah. It's so the cooling tube plus nozzle. So that the the heating zones are numbered from one to five. So heating zone one and two are on the main barrel on that D, piece of DOM tubing, and then brass tube that's bent has two heating zones on it and then the nozzle has its own heating zone and one of the reasons for the heating zones there is because after you've extruded your first time you've got solid plastic in there that you've got to melt um, and then secondly uh, if it's unheated, the temperature goes down so far that the plastic freezes before it gets out of the film and it just uh, out of the extruder and it just causes a jam. So the ability to control the temperature as it's cooling down, you know, to control that cooling, um, allows us to, you know, really precisely choose, you know how much cooling we want to have happen before the uh, plastic leaves the machine. Yeah. In a CAD that we looked at last year with a nozzle, I mean, the it seems the bands were not shown in there, or are they really tiny? Oh, they're not shown in there. They are not bands. They're actually uh, heating tape. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a nichrome wire that's wrapped in fiberglass. and Sleeve? Uh, half inch wide and about a foot long. Is that homemade or that you buy the sleeve or you buy the tape? You, it's, it's, um, here, let's see, I'll give you, um, let me see, I can, let me search in my email for my order, I can, uh, when did you begin on this filament maker? Oh man, so it's, this has gone through, we started working on filament in 2012, we were doing HDPE, 
Oh, wow. Um, and then we switched to, because then we tried printing HDPE, and um, just uh, had a, a, you know, we couldn't print it, so um, we ended up going with, Trying to find this. Well, here's it. I've got a Zorro link. It's, I, I generally buy it straight from the manufacturer. But, you know. um, so anyhow, we went to ABS, um, and then you know we were doing fine on making ABS filament. Um, you know, and we were extruding at like 10 times the rate at which other groups were extruding at back, back at that time. Um, but when we went to the areas where we wanted to extrude, we couldn't find safe sources of the ABS. Yeah. You know, so there was a whole ton of time into working on that that didn't pan out. <laughs> due to materials so we scrapped that and started focusing on PET um, and we've been working on PET since 20 I think end of, end of 2014 maybe mm -hmm. PET has been way harder yeah. than the other plastics for sure uh, so in 2012 you began on H with HDPE yeah yeah HDP is quite, yeah, I mean, our first extruder, we were using a drill for the motor, and, I mean, it was just direct drive, no gearing, one heating zone, it was a piece of plumbing pipe with a end cap and a hole drilled in it, you know, you could make the whole thing for like 100, 100 bucks or 120 bucks, yeah. no micro controller, we just bought a same temperature controller you probably have with your uh, Lyman filament extruder. Yeah. Um, you know, the body was made out of two by fours and stuff. I mean, it was super cheap. Um, and then to get really good diameter, you can just drill a hole in a piece of metal and uh, chamfer the back of it and you just pull the filament through and you just shave off everything excess and you know, get, it, get it right down to a nice piece of filament. Yeah. Okay. Here's a link to the type of thing that, um, that we're using for heating. I think heating bands, band heaters, uh, could be more economical. Um, the heaters that we're using tend to be about 50 bucks each. Um, so, yeah. I'm, uh -huh. It's one of those things where heaters have been working fine so i just had you know there hasn't been a huge motivation to change up yet um you know, if we did find some some nice cheap band heaters that fit on there um, does nichrome just in a sleeve work or what wants to be a band um i mean is the band basically one piece of nichrome or multiple pieces of nichrome in there um i would imagine it's a long zigzagged piece of nichrome that's packed into you know what some sort of well, what's the, the mineral that they use for insulation yeah fiberglass sleeve no yeah they use fiberglass they also use I, I don't think mica is it but it's something like mica um You know, like it's the same stuff that they use in kitty litter. Also. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, they also use fiberglass. Yeah, same, same thing. So uh, with the yeah, with the the basically that you know one of the big issues is just like you know you could buy your own nichrome, 
and make your own heaters. Um, my thought on that is because it's wrapped right onto a, a piece of steel um, that, and it's carrying mains current, and in overseas it's carrying 220. Um, that is best to use a professionally made one just to avoid any, uh, any you know, you know, reduce the risk of catastrophe. Although the machine is grounded, and you know, I typically have them set up with a ground fault uh, you know, plug. Yeah. Yeah. Just another comment. Like, I always think about hydraulics because that's the lowest cost for high torque. I'm um, just looking on eBay. There's, uh, you know, you can get torquey motors for seventy-three dollars. Now you need a power source, um, but that power source. Oh, yeah, uh, we yeah. use the micro power cube. The micro power cube, but you can get a pretty low-cost micro power cube if if you're thinking of like if you're integrating that system with a grinder, it would make sense to have like a hydraulic power source. Where you're grinding and then you've got hydraulic power now you're actually doing the hydraulic motor for 73 dollars you know yeah so i think it's you know stuff like that um the the you know i don't know maybe my strategy is isn't quite right i'm sure there are multiple strategies that was work would work that my thought on that motor is that it, you know because it's so easy for me to get whatever uh RPM I want uh, with it, yeah. you know, with its, its uh, ability. Um, that you know, once we, oh once yeah, we yeah, get system down. Yep, yep. No, I agree with that. We, okay, we need this. Uh, we need this RPM, and we can measure the, you know, measure what kind of torque we're getting at that RPM. Then we can we can just go out and find, you know, the cheapest source. For, for for that requirement and do away with the stepper yeah no I would agree with that that's that's the right way to go about it uh, figure out what you need exactly and then go with it mm -hmm. yeah but yeah it makes sense for, you know say if we when we when we finish the, you know, the grinder same thing you know and if it's if it's one of those things where we can pick a motor that'll work in both situations yep and set up a design where it's very easy to to pull the motor off of the grinder and slap it on the extruder. I think that'd be that'd be great, you know. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're on a big enough scale that you're running the extruder all day and you can't afford disconnecting it, then you are selling enough filament that buying a motor is not even a concern. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I I think for the experimental part, yeah, just getting everything down. I think that's the right procedure. Yeah, so that's it, you know, for for me the stepper, the nice thing about it is you know, it's it's open loop, so I don't have to deal with feedback control and tuning it to the system. I can pretty much just pick one that's strong enough and tell it how fast to go and it goes. And stepper motors are um, you know, People who 3D print understand stepper motors, so hooking them up should be relatively easy. Yeah. So that, those are kind of my my thoughts on initially choosing choosing them. Although it is like you know an entire third of the cost. Yeah. 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 No, that's that's all right. That's that's good. That's that's development, I guess. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, so let's see here. Where to go from here? Yeah. Um, let's see. We also, we've talked, I, I think, a fair amount about the non-contact diameter sensors on our previous call. Uh, and, I mean, I guess, oh, one, you know, one thing we haven't, talked about it's not very complicated at all but is the the, uh, the, the fume hood um, just 
just basically a sheet metal enclosure over the uh, extruder and it connects onto a piece of uh, tubing that, that comes out and just vents. Um, and I've just been using a, a little computer fan on that with like a little uh, PWM speed control on it so I can uh, adjust the, the flow. Um, either that or, or if, you know, actually in my shop I've got a, a, a you know, little exhaust system with blast gates. So, uh, this would be a across the whole extruder part the across the barrel and until it reaches the water or yeah so it goes out it, it hangs over the end of the extruder okay there's a there's a little gap be it's basically open on the bottom where the where the um where the cooling tube comes out it kind of kind of pokes out the bottom uh -huh. of it um and so basically as the as the molten plastic's coming out of the machine, there are fumes that come off of the, um, of the plastic there, and so, the, so those get drawn up into the fume hood. And then also at the feed throat, where the star feeder dumps plastic in, so there are fumes that typically would come out of that zone. Yeah, yeah. And actually where the bulk of the fume comes out. And so there's enough airflow that the flow actually goes into uh, that space instead of out of, so so you know it just gets the bulk of that fume out of the air that you're breathing. Yep, yeah. So it's just that small tube, like what, like six by six inches or so, or oh yeah, the the the, the sheet metal. Yeah, it's about it's about that. I, I can't remember offhand, but about six inches, five or six inches. Yeah, um, and, and again, you know, that's one of those things that I've kind of just slapped on there and, you know, set it up so that I could bend it with my sheet metal brake, um, you know, but you, it would be really nice to have a design that, um, that uh, is, I don't know, it, it doesn't really makes it difficult to get the gearbox on and off because you have to take that off to get the gearbox on and off you know it's just it could be done better yeah <laughs> what i'm trying to say uh, yeah um how much sag is there in the in the filament does it go to the all the way to the bottom at times or does it sometimes uh, make folds so that depends on how hot the plastic is when it's coming out of the extruder so if you, say, leave the cooling tube at its uh, max temps, which is basically so there's no cooling, um, yeah, it will go all the way down to the bottom and, you know, it actually snakes back and forth and, you know, there's like no tension on the filament as you're pulling it out. Um, and when you cool it, we typically set it down around 200 Celsius. And when we do that, um, there's a little bit of maybe a few inches of sag, but it's quite, you know, I would say, I don't know, maybe, maybe there are six inches of sag or so on, but it, it's a fairly direct line to that last uh, wheel there. And in fact, you know, the, the filament is stiff at that point, so some of that sag could actually be the stiffness of the filament kind of pushing down, you know, as, as it goes around a tight bend. The filament's trying to resist bending and, and maybe kind of pulling that sag in itself. Um, I've thought about maybe adding another roller help guide the filaments straight to the, uh, to the cooling tube. Um, so yeah, oh, another thing is getting the cooling tube, I need to change the bend angle of the cooling tube. Um, it's bent too steeply now. It's more, it's about at a 45, so it kind of points at the bottom of the tank, and it should point straight over to the roller. 
um, let's see, steeper or did you say steeper or shallow, less? Shallow. More shallow. Sorry, more shallow there, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so, you know, again, part of the unknowns is as you go into the water at an angle, how does that affect the roundness of the moment? Uh, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of extruders will... Um, will extrude totally horizontally and um, the, you know, the, the water will kind of be overflowing the water tank and the filament will just shoot right into the water through the water, basically like through the top of the waterfall. Um, but with PET, and it, I mean, if you look at videos of uh, extrusion of PET, online, you'll see them typically go into the water at an angle or vertically um, because the, the melt is so weak, you know, you can't pull it, um, you know, you can't pull it horizontally very well. Right, but you're thinking it should be more shallow rather than more steep, or? Yeah, right now for us it should because if you look at the filament, coming off of the nozzle, it actually bends at an angle right at the nozzle, and we're getting oblong filament, and it's because we're, we're, we're pulling a, you know, a cylinder to the side, right as uh, it's coming out of the... Oh, you're actually pulling on an upper edge? Well, as you're pulling on the, the filament, you know, imagine... The, yeah, uh, the upper edge hits the tube. Yeah, exactly. The upper edge is, is kind of hitting the tube, so it's, it's kind of shearing a little bit and, and taking an oblong shape. Um, How quickly does it, once it gets into the water, yeah, huh? no, I, I'd have to see it to make any meaningful comments here. Yeah, because um, once it gets into the water, like, it's pretty much solidifies, like, pretty much instant. Like, once it hits the water, it... The outer, it kind of think of it like it gets a skin on the outer it's a skin. surface, but yeah. you know, plastic is a poor conductor, so mm -hmm. you know it does take a while for that filament to cool down. I see. Uh, yeah, and in fact, we started with a much smaller water bath, and the big issue was the plastic just couldn't conduct the heat quickly enough to get it into the water. Uh, so you need more length in the water bath. Yeah. So, now, if we do go to a shallower water bath, you know, we may be able to just say, get a big long piece of pipe, you know, or, or you know, something like, you know, it, the, the, the water bath, you know, getting that big old piece of sheet metal to fold up, you know, is a significant cost. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're going only a few inches, <clears throat> well, the only the only reason why I could see keeping the larger water bath is that that water bath has a lot of thermal mass. Um, right. They help regulate the temperature, you know, and um, uh, you know have that surface area to kind of get it hit an equilibrium that's not too high of a temperature. Yeah. Would you be tending to an even longer water bath, or? Uh, possibly, you know, if our, if the if the speed of extrusion goes up much, say with a more professional screw, uh, oh yeah, would necessitate a longer water bath. Yeah. Um. The the other thing, though, so. I mean, the main thing is you've got to get the temperature of the filament, you know, down fast enough so that it doesn't crystallize. So if it, for example, if it doesn't spend enough time in cool water, it'll, it'll look amorphous and clear. I've had filament where you extrude it, and then the next day when you go to unspool the filament, and it just starts yeah. snapping. And when you feed it, actually, we, we had this, um, we, we dried some filament in, in Nairobi at too high of a temperature. 
And when we did that, when we went to extrude it, you know, there's pressure between the uh, hobbed bolts and the idler in the extruder on a 3D printer. And that pressure would keep cracking the filament. And we couldn't 3D print with it. Yeah. So definitely getting nice amorphous filament is critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it seems like my, yeah, I could see the pain in that trough. That's not easy stuff. I would, I would be inclined for like six, like what about six inch PVC? You think that would be, I mean, you'd have to have flow, like pumping. Yeah, so you but, might, you know, we might be able to do something, let's say like use six inch PVC where you cut the, you know, cut the top off of it. Um, yeah. And then, you know, or drip some sort of drainage pipe. And then, uh, Use um, uh, what was I gonna say? Use a uh, just like a 55 gallon drum and a little pump. You know, yeah. You can buy a, a little pump for like four bucks, 12 volt DC submergible pump. Right. That's not too hard. To yeah. Show. No. Like right now, I see um, that's that's major work there. Yeah. Now another route to go that I saw out the window of a bus as I was cruising along in Nairobi is to just cut some 55 gallon drums in half and weld them together end to end. How do you weld them? You know, it would just be just arc, like a cut the bottoms, say take a barrel, cut the bottom off of it. Oh, yeah. Cut it in half and, and put, put them end to end okay. so when you weld around the, the bottom you have a trough. Yep. So I, I saw a big long trough made that way. I don't know what they were using it for. Yep. I don't know how much 55 gallon drums cost, but that would save like, you know, welding all the seams and all that kind of junk. Yep. Okay. No, this is great work altogether. This is pretty impressive as far as all the details that have already been considered in here. So that's excellent. Um, What's your schedule looking like for the next few weeks? Next few weeks, so um, we are, let's see, There's. I have to do some microscope work. They're having some issues um, with the microscope, so I got to, I, you know, I'm going to be spending a significant portion of my time in the next couple of weeks um, helping them get that stuff sorted out. And then, although I don't think it'll take so long, it might only be about a week. Then after that, I'm pretty much 100% dedicated to documentation of this and then rebuilding my own equipment here. You're going to rebuilding how far you're at uh, at present? Zero. Okay. You have a oh, shop? Well, okay, that's not true. I have a water bath and... I have a stand for the extruder. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm at ten percent. You got a, you got a ho shop at your house, or? Yeah. So here I've got a. You know, I, I work at home, so I've got a two-car garage. That's my shop. Um, in there, I've got a. You know, one of the lightweight grizzly mills. I've got a old South Bend lathe. I've got uh, four 3D printers and a gazillion hand tools, oxyacetylene welding and some sheet metal here. You know, a real basic shop. Yeah, um, that's cool. Um, so when you're going to be building a new here, like what you're going to consider the changes you want to make? You haven't I, That's a good question. Like, do I, do I launch into design and build now, or do I just get up and running? So I, you know, because there's all that testing we were talking about that I have not yet done. Um, right. You know, so, so do, I, do I get it set up and then test some of those things and then make the changes? Um, there are a few changes that I will make automatic. Um from what you see in the design here, for example, bending the, the cooling tube so that it's bent at the right angle. Um, let's see, what else? The, the, the vibratory conveyor and the where the hopper is held on, um, there's a, a 
better design that, that I've done on that. Um, I don't know where the design files are, but um, anyhow, I'll redo that. Um, I'm not sure if I'll spend much time changing the control box because with the bigger stepper motor, the big stepper driver doesn't fit in very well, um, along with a, a big 12 volt power supply. So, you know, but I may, again, seeing as how the motor will likely change in the future, I probably won't redesign the control box. I'll just kind of leave the sides of it open and wires shooting out everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, the barrel, so like changing the size of the barrel and getting a, a, a screw, oof, that's quite tempting to do. Um, yeah. I so you think, think you just get really good performance increase on that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. The amount I of... think uh, from, from everything I've read about other groups that made the switch... To a to a real screw was you know. So you mean less power for for the throughput, things like that. Probably Consistency. more power is the issue. So like I might not be able to run as fast, or I might need to to make a new gearbox. Um, more power, so so at the at the advantage of consistency. Yeah. So really. Um, you know, what I think it's all about achieving high pressure at, you know, at the end of the screw. Um, you know, like in industry, I was talking with the industry guys, and they're like, oh, yeah, you should include a pressure relief valve on the end of your barrel so that it doesn't blow off like a cannon. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I just kind of chuckled. I was like, uh, <laughs> with the screw I have, I'm, I'm pretty certain that that is not an issue. Um, yeah. You know, and, and like I can put a melt, you know, basically we can freeze the end of the, the barrel and, and basically the screw just starts skipping steps, you know. It, it, yeah. I mean, uh, your goal, the main goal on a, on a professional screw is uh, getting larger throughput through the machine. And building the pressure. So if you do have higher pressure, the pressure variations are, um, you know, the, the, I guess the signal to noise ratio gets a lot better. Aha, uh, uh -huh. you really smooth out the pressure variations? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so you're extruding at a higher rate, and also those variations just aren't impacting as, as much. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, I could see that as being a huge benefit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you um, if you decide to, well, I mean, when you're going to be starting to build, that's going to be what, like, end of January? Yeah, it might be even sooner than, than that. Let's see. It'll probably be mid-January. I'll, I'll be starting to build. I'm already starting to order parts. Uh-huh. Yeah. And and how long does it take you to put this together? From scratch, with everything ready, it's been so long since I've done that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Last time I did it, it took me a couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, it wasn't... Again, it wasn't like a perfect run. I was also, you know, solving problems and that sort of thing. So mid-February, you should be up and running again? Oh, yeah. I would guess. Okay. So, yeah. No, that's that's really good. So at that point, um, if we think about a potential schedule of actually doing a workshop on, on this build, which... I mean, I think that the thing that people would really like about this is just the depth of all the learnings on all the, I mean, from your experience. I mean, that's, I think that's really valuable. Um, I think we can get people to show up. When do you think would be a, a time to do that? So when I was uh, looking at the, the calendar, so one thing that I had forgot we had, you know, we had, you had originally mentioned April, and it turns out that I will be in Malawi all of April. Yeah. Um, 
So May might be a good time to do it, especially because that may give me a chance to sort out a few of these issues. Yep. Um, so, like, you know, kind of like that I was saying in the last call, like, you know, there are, you know, as you can tell from all the detail, we, you know, like, it hasn't been a, a cakewalk. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if we can crack a few of those issues before before setting it up with you guys, it's just that many fewer headaches. <laughs> yeah, we should maybe discuss, uh, maybe next time let's talk about the critical issues on this path to a oh, successful... Right now. So, so what I'll be yeah. doing um, on, on this, um, so uh, on GitHub, you know how you can um, you can create issue uh, yep. issues. Yep. So I'll be as I get going on the wiki. The other thing I'll get going on is basically just creating my own issues. You know, so I'll, I'll, in those issues, I'll basically try and document what the problems are and what my thoughts are to solve them. You know, and that'll be a great kind of open spot where people can can add in their experience. Um, yeah. Uh, would you be able to do like a more detailed, like uh, so in your diagram you've got pretty much nine parts. Can you get much more granular on that? Like, oh, I will be getting very granular. Uh, I'll be getting down to, you know, nuts and bolts. And yeah, yeah. Gosh, no, uh, yeah, if you do that, then I can, you know, I can actually, you know, Provide some more feedback on that. Yeah. Yeah. So that will be. I think I'm getting fairly close. Just kind of looking through the the readme. Um. I think I've got to do a little bit. I got to add a little bit in the software, and I got to write the operation section. Um. You know, which again is just going to be a. You know really not enough to start operating but to just key someone into this is what it takes to operate the machine yeah um so once i write those two then i'm basically going to be using the readme to guide me through the wiki and you know the procedure and all that kind of stuff yeah regarding documentation just you know the, with the workflow if you're using solidworks uh if you could you know if we could design a workflow where we're getting the step files out in a reliable way, then we can pretty much do a lot of the documentation within FreeCAD. So we can convert it to FreeCAD. Okay, so... As far as our team is concerned. Yeah. Let's see here. Describe a bit more about what you would... Yeah. So if you export uh, export step files of individual parts... Absolutely all yeah. all uh, step files right now. Yeah. Uh, I have the the one that you have right now, and then I'm assuming there might be a few little changes. Oh yes, yeah. so probably if, will go. If you notice on the step files, for example, the um, the outfeed rollers are just kind of floating in the air, They're not really connected onto anything. Yeah. Um, and you know, pretty much what we do is we just clamp a a metal bar onto the end of the water bath and then clamp it onto the, the outfeed rollers. Um, originally, the outfeed rollers were going to be over the water, but we needed absolutely all of the length of the water bath, so we put them outboard. Um, yeah, so there there will be little little things like that. But yeah, so I can keep you updated on, on step files as I, as I get them changed. Um, there will also be, so there are certain things that also aren't modeled, um, like threads cut on the barrels. Yep. Like that, um, that, I could, that I could maybe add in to the model. Um, you know, that will also help inform the documentation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the goal would be if the model is perfect, then we can extract um, very detailed fab drawings and everything else for the documentation, exploded part diagrams and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Now that's, here's the thing, I wonder, yeah, so that, um, I frequently do those exploded diagrams in SolidWorks 
works as well to um, you know, to show how how things get assembled and so on. Yeah. And I wonder what would be better if I, you know, if I just send those files over to you guys and let you guys do that part. That'll reduce my workload for certain. How long does it take you to do the exploded part animations, for example? Um, a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, like to let's see, to animate. It's been a while since I've animated one. Yeah, um, but yeah. I think it's just a button and click. No, I think, you know, like if the division of labor could be that that we can handle a lot of the CAD documentation work, so fab drawings, exploded part diagrams, exploded part animations, uh, that's kind of stuff we can do, and it's just plain documentation, okay. like um, annotated drawings. Yeah, yeah, that would be, so you know a lot what, of that. Um, Maybe what I should do, let's see here. Um, I'll put a, like placeholders in the wiki where we need, um, say, say where an, ex where an exploded di uh, drawing might be good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then you know, or, or an animated one. Typically what, what, what I've usually done, um, oh, here, I can give you a link. Let's see here. Just to show you what, what I did with the 3D printer. Um, just send you this is straight to the link where you can download the whole design and everything. Okay, there you go. Um, I mean, the thing that I'd like to see if we can put it also on Hero X. So, I'm, pl I'm, I'm going to get up the open source microfactory challenge I'm gonna put that online which is primarily about uh, 3d printing filament uh -huh. maker but making it like the design would focus around a, a cordless drill or cordless power tool construction set uh -huh. and in it the filament maker I think could go in there or we could do us a, a separate one for the filament maker but I was thinking for the open source microfactory challenge the filament maker would be we can put a you know, possibly there's ways to leverage that for some design contributions. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly would uh, we could put up there because not a lot. This would be like specialist territory. Like only the extruder people would know about this, so it's not really yeah. highly popular. So yeah. that's you know that's you know we're not <laughs> gonna. I guess when you talk about crowd contributions, uh, you have to give people something that's you know so many people can try out. Like that's why the cordless yeah. drill would be. Like a super modular, scalable cordless drill, a really super flexible. That's something that everyone with a 3D printer could tackle. But for this, the filament maker, it's a little tougher because it gets into all this technical know-how. Yeah, there's a ton of that, and you know that's been my my difficulty. Right. That, you know, when I've in the past say tried to get uh, assistance, yeah, uh, people who don't have the technical knowledge. Um, it takes me a long time to get them to the point where they yeah. understand what's going on yeah. and why certain things are happening. Yeah. Not to say that I, I know it all. I definitely do not. Right. The way that this could work, we could do like, so the majority of the problem could could be around the main core work around the cordless drill, but there could be a section of that like, for that much smaller audience that does have that technical expertise, we can just pretty much hear our critical issues, certain design points that we want, and throw that out to the crowd. I think that could definitely be a way we can approach it. Whereas yeah. we're not really relying on that, to, you know. But 
uh, we can be surprised. And the way it works is like if nobody solves those problems, we don't give out the money. You know, we don't give out the incentive prize. The idea with Hero X is we would crowdfund the the prize itself. So that would be part of the work. But I think it's definitely worth trying, and and uh, I'll think about that more. I'll you know as I co continue on this, I'll keep you in the loop on that. We yeah, can talk the, about uh, that. Let's see what was I going to say on that. You know, we've talked with experts on the extrusion thing. And, you know, again, it's like in an hour long conversation with an expert who's got a very full time job, you know, again, you can't get into details enough to really get useful information. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you. you Hopefully, somewhere, you know, if we cast our net out there, we'll find someone who does have the specialty knowledge and is willing to contribute a, a bit of time to really look at things. And, and yeah, I mean, there's that interesting psychology about the incentive challenges that I kind of see happening, and that is that people actually will spend the time because it's kind of like for the ego or for the glory, kind of like yeah. that, that incentive motivation really, really puts people in different mindset mm -hmm. so yeah we'll we'll see we'll we'll see where that takes us that's i'm really excited about that um since i read up on that i read the book bold did you ever hear hear the book bold by peter diamandis no I talks a lot about about these topics but he's he's the guy that created the the x prize and he also wow. Some of the spin-offs is the Hero X platform, which is crowdfunded, crowd design challenges, essentially incentive prizes. But I think that's got a lot of potential, and I, I don't think it's utilized enough. So I think we'll be good experimenting with this too. And it can't hurt because it will form us to communicate and, and you know get more supporters anyway. So. You know, so William has also been talking about doing some sort of crowd-funded uh, thing. Um, so it may be good to, to, to also bounce some ideas off him. Um, and William is, is that William, your part? William's the director of Tech for Trade. Yep. Um, so yeah, that'd be, uh, um, and he's also, so like kind of on the European front, he's got quite a few connections. Yep. Um, okay. So, and I know they've done, they've done some design challenges in the past or for other things like 3d printable sunglasses and so on um, okay yeah we should compare notes you um, have some good uh good connections there does he have anything specific planned on that or um no not yet uh, how often do you talk to him you you, you got re regular we, calls yeah we have regular calls um Typically, I talk to him about once a week. Yeah. Um, although during this, I probably won't talk to him until about mid, early to mid January. At this point, I think he's on winter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Definitely. No, this is pretty exciting. So. Yeah, it would be great if we could, you know, if we could do that as a as a joint. Yeah. Venture. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and, um, I mean, idea is that with this filament maker, if we can do PET, then we can squeeze anything else through this, right? Um, or is this more for PET? I would say, uh, with potential modifications, for example, the cooling tube yep. would probably be a really bad idea for most other plastics. I mean, that's also, that's something that is usually to this extruder compared to any other extruder I've ever seen. seen. Yep. Um, and uh, I have a feeling if you talk to experts that a lot of them will just say that's flat out crazy. Uh, um, because so the, like the good thing is is it changes the viscosity. The really bad thing about it is that um, it basically causes a giant pressure drop for the nozzle, whereas you really want the pressure drop to happen at the nozzle. Yeah. Um, 
you know, think about like a, a drippy faucet, you know, where the pressure drop is happening in the valve instead of at the at the at the end of the faucet. Right. Um, versus having the pressure drop happen right at the faucet and get a nice jet of water out. Um, but at the same time, it's the only way that we've been, you know, like another possibility would be able to have, you know, would be to say have an even longer barrel where we could, you know, have the temperature of the barrel go up and melt the plastic and then go back down to get the viscosity and then have the, the, um, the, the nozzle at the end of the barrel. Oh, so... Because right now you're limited because you can only pretty much get it up to up to melting. You'd you'd like to have a cooling zone. Yeah, we'd like to have a cooling zone after we get it up to melting, because that's where we get the viscosity. Yeah, and is it that the 18 inches is just not long enough for that? No, no, it's not long enough. Yeah. Yep. So it. Well, I mean, I haven't, I honestly haven't tried, say, packing all the heaters, you know, down at the root of the screw and, and you know, trying to, to, to change that on the barrel. But my guess is, is you know, because the other thing is we reduce the diameter a lot, so we get a, you know, surface area to volume boost so that we can cool it down. also outside of the insulation so it cools as well. I thought I'd have to have a fan on it, but I didn't. You know, in fact, I had, you know, I had to replace the fan with the heaters because it was just freezing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about, uh, let's get into details like this, like the... Um, next, yeah, next, next time. time. I don't know where, uh, is there a particular area you would like uh, me to focus on with that. Um, well, I would say that the um, the extruder itself, the the auger, the details of that until you leave the leave the tube, like once you're one inch into the water. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Just so focus I'll start on with that. the main body of the extruder then. Um, yeah. Get nailing those details. Yeah. And. Yeah. All right. All right. That sounds great. So, I'll, so um, why don't I do this? When I get a, when I, uh, as I get chunks up, I'll just shoot you an email so so that you're aware of it. And then when you when you think it's a good time for for another conversation about how things are going, um, and, and where you guys can start plugging drawings in. Okay. And sounds I'm good. Uh, and so. But just one more on the uh, versatility of the device. If you do get rid of the cooling tube, would this work yeah. well for other materials, like with some yeah. just minor yeah. modifications? So it's essentially the same extruder as the one we were using for ABS. Um, you just remove the cooling tube and put a nozzle right on the end of the machine. No water bath? Um, you could could even use I mean I've seen water baths used with uh, ABS although you could potentially skip the water bath um, you know which may allow you to skip drying the filament um, you know just maybe put some rollers uh, across the top of the, the water bath um, yeah it all depends on how much you need to get the, the filament, it, it depends basically on the melt strength of the filament. Like, if it's uh, strong enough that you can, you know, you can put it under enough tension to keep it from sagging too much, then yeah, you could just pull it straight across. Um, originally, the extruder that we did with ABS was same exact thing, but it was mounted vertically. Yeah. And it would extrude straight down. And yeah. I think, in general, keeping it 
uh, in a construction set approach of modularity, then mm -hmm. you know we can do the modification. So think of it a lot as as building blocks and modules. Yeah. yeah. You could you know you could always the the way it's built now actually some of the the frame that's historically in there was in there because that's how I bolted it onto the wall. Yeah. So you could actually just remove it and bolt it straight onto the wall if you wanted to, to you know you just have to change the connection between the feed throat and the hopper. But yeah, that could be done. And with all the other electronics everything is modular you know in terms of its control so you know there's just one common 12 volt and ground and then a, a i2c bus that you plug into each of the added components like the star feeder or the diameter sensors so if you don't have those it doesn't really change anything with the main extruder yeah okay from your experience, is PT pretty easy to print with compared to ABS and PLA? It prints awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's um, shrinkage is good. No, no little shrinkage. Less warping. than P PLA, I would I would guess. Warping issues don't exist really. Yeah, yeah I have not had any warping issues at yeah. all. Um, the only issues that you have that so the issues that I've had are um, one is that you've got to get the temperature down quickly so that it's at least somewhat amorphous um, so sometimes the prints will be a bit brittle so um It'll be like if you print a, a part that should bend, and if you bend, 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 it'll bend, and then all of a sudden it'll just explode. <laughs> you know, it doesn't it doesn't yield when it fails; it, it ruptures. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, but if you get the cooling right, you can avoid that, and that also depends to some extent on your part design because of how it holds heat and so on. Um, also could very well depend on ambient temperature and so on. Um, yep. The other issues that I have had depend more on inconsistency in the filament than um, printability of the material. Yep. Printability of the material is phenomenal. Yeah. No, this is great. You've got to dry it out. So it's got to be dry. If it's not dry, then it foams up and clogs the nozzle. So long as it's dry, then yeah. How do you how do you dry it? So what we do is we we have a, a box that we keep the filament in next to the printer, um, and it's got a uh, basically a print bed inside of the box, and we keep it at like 60 degrees Celsius, um, and that dries out the filament. For how long? I would say typically around, you want to do at least four hours before you start printing. Okay. Um, and then do you put it in a, in a plastic bag and seal it, or how do you typically store it? Once you've got your filament dry, um, if you keep it in a sealed environment, it should be, you know, so long as more moisture isn't getting to it, it should be good. Um, so we typically keep it in that box with desiccant in it, and then we can just turn on the heater as we, you know, as we need. Um, our original box is cardboard, so that happens yeah. to be... If you, if you have it dry and you put it in a Ziploc bag, would that do? Or That would help. Um, if you put it in a, dry, in a Ziploc with desiccant, that would help even more. Um, I think, though, it would be better to have a permanent solution. It's actually, we're working on it. Um, uh, is uh, the, actually the guy in Nairobi that uh, we've hired was doing the designs for that box. And unfortunately, like the day after I left, his hard drive crashed and lost it all. But uh, what's the what's the mechanism? It's uh, Is it a box or is it just sealing it's, yeah, in a... It's a box with a spool holder um, and a, 
tube that delivers the filament to the printer. And so, so the, 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 the filament does not see the light of day until it's as a part. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have contact with air until it ends. You know, until it, well, I guess there's a small gap where it exits that tube and it goes through the, the extruder of the printer. Doesn't doesn't touch air until just before it's excluded. Yeah. How quickly does a if you got dry filament? How quickly does it pick up? You know, say it's a hundred percent humidity. How quickly does it pick up enough to clog up your um, nozzle? Thirty minutes. Give or take. So in that sense, it's much worse than like ABS and PLA. Oh yeah, it's much more sensitive to moisture than ABS or PLA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, that's one of the issues of of working with PET. Now the the thing is though is um you know once you have that you know even with PLA or ABS those do absorb absorb moisture and you know I have like my shop uh, when it's been really rainy out I've definitely had issues. Especially with ABS, actually. Foaming yeah. Up. Um, if you if you vacuum seal in a bag, that that would definitely keep it for a long time, or that, yeah, that would extend the shelf life. You know, if you just vacuum seal in a bag with some desiccant, that would. You know, I don't know what the shelf life would be, but I would imagine it would be pretty long. You know, but then, say when I open that, I would want to immediately put it in a dry container. Filamental debris. So, like, what we're what we're going to be doing in Nairobi is when we when we move on to start selling the filament, we will um, sell the filament drying setup at cost. So, yeah, we'll sell that at cost because you know and get the price as low as possible because once people kind of commit to the system. Then we've got a customer, you know, that's that's on board for for a while. Yeah. Um, and you know, we'll be able to sell filament for them at half price. Um, yeah, excellent. So, so yeah, those are so those jobs like working on that box. Um, I will be, you know, I think. What we were thinking about doing is splitting my time kind of 50-50 between documentation and, you know, other things. And the other things were going to be rebuilding the extruder and working on that box and so on, just kind of whatever whatever is, is kind of the, the high priority thing. So that, you know, I can't sit in front of the computer all day long and I'd go crazy. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, excellent. Yeah, so yeah, let's continue on this and so when you when you get some more documentation, pass it on my way. We can set up another time to talk. Yeah, we'll do and I'll be I'll be doing, you know, fairly frequent commits onto GitHub. So if you you know, if you haven't seen an email but you're curious as to where I am, you know, if you just check out the repository, you'll, you'll get the latest. All right. Cool. Excellent. Well, Good talking with you. All right, Matt. Thanks a lot. This is good. So let's continue. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.